Welcome back to another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic, where I try and solve your bike-related problems. So if you've got one, make sure you leave it for me down there in the comments section below, or on all forms of social media using the hashtag AskGCNTech. With no further ado, let's go on to the first question this week that comes in from G Wilkinson, who says, hi John, I have a bearing question. Uh-oh. Uh, do pro riders remove the dust cover and replace the grease with oil in cartridge bearings? I have read that the dust covers are the major contributor to friction in a bearing, so it would make sense to remove them if riding a time trial race. Regards, Guy. And then it's got George or Alex. So, not sure what that is. Maybe you go under a few different names. Either way, um, now some may do this, especially for a time trial like you say, but majority certainly would not. The reason being is that for a pro mechanic then to have to take extra special care over that because if you're putting oil or a very thin oil inside of a cartridge bearing instead of grease, obviously it's not going to last quite as long because it's going to be able to escape through those seals. Um, but yeah, some riders out there may well do it. Some are very, very, very particular about their equipment. I think it was Alberto Contador or Fabian Cancellara. One of the two used to have their mechanic warm up their wheels before they went out, or warm up their bearings rather, by spinning the wheels on the race wheels uh, for a number of minutes. I think it was about half an hour actually, just to try and loosen up the grease inside of the bearing so the wheels span a little bit faster. Whether or not it actually made any difference, I do not know. But it's in, uh, interesting you do say about the, uh, the the dust covers being a major contributor to the friction. Yes, I've actually got two bearings on my desk right now. Not this one, but my work desk. Uh, and they are identical in the actual materials being made, everything like that, what they're made out of. But the seals on them are different. One of them is uh, a non-contact seal and the other one slightly contacts and the resistance in the, the drag if you like when you try and turn the bearing is absolutely huge but both are still silky smooth just one has a lot more resistance so yeah you could flush out the grease and replace it with thin oil but you're probably never really going to actually notice the difference but as for the pros nah they probably don't actually do it Next up, we've got Mark Matthews, who says, Hi, my lovely 1990 Campagnolo Chorus 8-speed hubs have loose bearings, which I've replaced and re-greased. The wheels, though, just don't run smooth. On closer inspection, looks like the cups are pitted. Can you change the bearing cups on older Campag hubs? And is it an easy-ish job? Cheers. Another bearing question. Right. Uh... I don't actually know the exact answer for this particular model, 1990 chorus hub i was a young young gentleman back then uh but certainly hubs from around that era i think even ones from before you were able to do so so unless they took away that technology and then reintroduced it at a later date because they have that still now to this date as far as i'm aware yeah it's quite an easy job to do what it is the actual uh cups of the hub are pressed inside of the hub shell and are removed with a a kind of claw if you like that you put inside of the where, where the axle would be then you wind a little a little knob on the end of a, of a bolt and it expands this claw and you can just pull them out it's not quite as easy as that it does require a little bit of elbow grease the tool though isn't that expensive i think it's about 30 pounds or something. So you're probably only gonna do this once or twice, so it's probably worth trying to find one. Uh, I think Campagnolo Service Centers, there's a big list of them somewhere online. So it means, yeah, you can probably do this with that hub. Apologies though, I don't know the exact, you know, if it is certainly doable on that particular hub, but I reckon it more than likely is, which means your hubs aren't disposable, you can refurbish them, rejuvenate them, and give them a little bit of extra life. Next up, we've got Albert Donald, who says, I'm going to put on a new rear derailleur cable. Can I change the cable without unwrapping the drop bar tape? Oh, Albert, it depends, possibly. Sometimes when you put a new, uh, a new inner cable in through your brake lever, it goes into the outer cable nice and easy. Other times, you spend ages trying to push it around so it goes inside the little end of the ferrule and then goes inside of the cable. Uh, easiest thing really is to try it always with a new cable because the ends of them, of, of the uh, inner cable, are always soldered. So it means they're not gonna fray when you poke them through. So don't cut the cable out of the packet. Try and get one that you don't have to cut uh, two opposing uh, nipple ends off of. Instead, just try and get one which is absolutely fine. With derailleurs, generally, they uh, they come just with that standard round-shaped uh, nipple on the end of it. So just whack that one in and see. 
If you do have to undo the uh, handlebar tape, then I'd probably advise actually putting in a new length of outer cable too, so you're gonna get silky smooth, crispy indexed gear shifting. Next one comes in from Marcel R, who says, Hi John, I'm upgrading from 10 to 11 speed, and I wanna keep using my 10 speed Jura Ace 7900 C24 wheels. Lovely pair of wheels they are. Uh, can I swap the current free hub for a Shimano 11 speed free hub? If so, does any 11 speed Shimano free hub work? If not, any other suggestions? Thanks. Uh, no, afraid not. Uh, the reason being the 11 speed free hub bodies are slightly wider than the 10 speed. I think it's 2.85 millimeters, which makes me sound like a right geek, but I'm pretty sure it is that 2.85. Um, now the reason that it can still fit inside of your rear dropouts or rear end, that overlock nut distance, is because the hub flanges then get closer together so that it can accommodate that slightly wider cassette body. Um, so you can't put one on there, I'm afraid. But what you can do, I have heard of people doing this, is actually shave a little bit of material off of the free hub body. Obviously it's gonna invalidate any warranty you've got and it's totally at your own risk. And then you can shave a bit off of uh, the rear side of the cassette, of an 11 speed cassette, and it will go on there fine. I've never tried it, mates of mine have, said it works fine. The other option for you is an Edco monoblock cassette, I think it's called. Uh, and that simply slides on like any other cassette but the 10 tooth, no sorry, the 11th sprocket acts like a, a, a 10 tooth if you like, so it looks really, really small on there and it threads into uh, where your lock ring would normally go on a traditional cassette and it works. It's an amazing bit of kit that, so that's certainly an option for you to consider too. Next up is a question from Not So Swift or Not So Swift clever play on words that, uh, who says they've got a bike they run tubular tires on and they want to change from the mastic glue, so traditional tubular tire cement, uh, to a tape like Yantex or Jantex, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Uh, the rims are the Ambrosio Nemesis, so they're aluminium ones. Is there any special cleaning or preparation that they should do to ensure a good bond? Uh, Not So Swift doesn't fancy rolling a tire, as they did that once, and it didn't end out well. Out of interest, their other wheels are carbon. Would there be a different process if they decide to also use tubular tape in the future? Thanks in advance. Right, this is my preferred way of attaching tires to uh, tubular wheels. I nearly say glue because it's not glue, it's a self-adhesive tape. It's like really, really, really strong double-sided tape. Um, I prefer it because it's well, less messy, I like that. Um, so yes, first up, you are gonna require some good old-fashioned elbow grease because getting off that tubular glue is a pretty hard job, quite messy, it tends to come off in really long bits and then really small bits, and you really, in my opinion, when you're applying a, uh, a tubular tire tape, so some tub tape, and we're gonna call it, you want it to be as firmly placed onto that rim bed as possible. These days, with wider tires and wider rims, it's not that easy, I don't reckon, but hey, I'm sure you'll all get involved down in the comment section below. So yeah, good old fashioned elbow grease, plus, for aluminium rims, I've also used it on carbon, and I've seen pro mechanics do it too, is to use something called acetone. It's not that easy to get hold of, and it's not that good for you either, really. Well, it's actually, it's not too bad. It's a component of nail varnish remover, so uh, if you've got into that line around, you could try some of that, but you really want the strongest stuff. Wear a pair of rubber gloves, though, and rub it over, and try and get that glue to come off. Failing that, a friend of mine on his carbon wheels, he used, now, Hand on heart, this is exactly what he did. He actually used an apple core, so he ate his apple and then rubbed that over the tubular glue, and for some reason it had a chemical reaction of some sort, and the glue peeled off. It was pretty messy, pretty sticky, but yeah, it did come off really easily, so you could try that. Um, now, a little bit of advice here for that tub tape. When you apply it onto the smooth as you can get it surface, press it down on with your thumb and then put the tire on. Don't take off the backing tape, so the, the double-sided tape if you like, which is gonna stick the tire onto the tape. Put the tire onto the rim and whack it up to its maximum pressure for a few days, maybe even a week. That way, the pressure of the tire, the tubular tire and the carcass is gonna be pressing that tape into place on the rim, giving it a really good bond, lots and lots of adhesion. Then you can go ahead, the lovely process of just peeling away the tape making sure the tire is nice and straight in place. And then whack it up to maximum pressure again, just to make sure that it's got a nice amount of adhesion. 
Next up, we've got XD Joe Bikes 99 who says, hi John, I've got a Voodoo Limba cyclocross bike and it seems to skip gears a lot. I've crashed it a lot, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Yeah, I reckon it probably has got something to do with it. Sounds to me like your rear derailleur hanger, it's probably slightly bent inwards from one of those plenty of crashes that you've had and it's just made the uh, derailleur not sit quite in place underneath the cassette. So that'd be my first port of call, pop down to the local bike shop, get them to have a look. Uh, they've got a derailleur alignment gauge. I've got one just up here. That was close. Here's one I prepared earlier. So what happens is this bit here, that threads into the uh, derailleur hanger and then this is a gauge here that you line it up throughout different stages of the actual rim to check how in line it is. It's a wonderful bit of kit, that. Uh, failing that, if it's not, could well be that your chain's worn, your cassette's worn, or that your cables are so grotty and horrible and they need replacing, but try it in that order and hopefully you'll be sorted and, uh, well, skip free gears in future. And the penultimate one this week comes in from Dome Dom, who says, Hey John, I upgraded my group set to the latest Shimano 105R7000, but the brakes do not fit with my frame. The brake arms are too short, therefore the pads are not centered on the rim. Is there a different version of the R7000 brakes or what dual pivot brake set can you recommend that has a similar performance? Right, as far as I know, the R7000s only come in that style of drop. So I think it's 49 to 54 drop maybe 55, can't remember off the top of my head, but basically it's like a, a racy style brake. So what you need is the Shimano BR650s, I think they're called. Uh, I use that on my winter bike and it means I can put mug guards underneath it. Uh, so what it is, the actual arms, if you like, the brake calipers where the pads attach are slightly longer, slightly deeper in their drop and it can accommodate. Uh, I don't know, you don't say on there it's an older frame or anything, but quite commonly that's what you have to use on older frames where the clearance aren't quite as close uh, but on a winter bike like mine the brake stay has just been moved up so you can put those mug guards in there so that's what I'd have a look the braking performance on them absolutely brilliant you could also look at other brands such as Tektro or TRP same company they also make aftermarket solutions uh, that are Shimano compatible too and the final one this week comes in from Joran Vandala who says John I'm looking to buy a CX bike in the next couple of months but I'm struggling with whether I should buy some new cyclocross or mountain bike shoes. Currently, I'm riding my two and a half year old road bike with road shoes and pedals, but I'll need some new pedals anyway because they have seen their best days. Uh, should I invest in some cyclocross and mountain bike shoes and corresponding pedals or not? Right, if you're gonna be using that cyclocross bike off-road, 100%. Uh, the reason being, if you're using a road shoe and road pedal, well, generally, they're only one-sided, unless, of course, you're using speed plates, they're two-sided. Uh, you can get some road SPTs that are double-sided, but they're pretty old, I think. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely go for it, because if you're getting off the bike, and you're walking around in those slippery soled shoes, you're gonna be in all sorts of trouble. And if it's muddy, if it's gunky, those cleats, they're gonna get gummed up and the pedals, they're gonna be bashed around too. So definitely go for something like that. They're gonna be harder wearing, the cleats nice and recessed, so it's gonna last longer too. Definitely always go for that. Sounds daft, but yeah, I've seen people before try and ride mountain bikes or cross bikes in road shoes, it never ended well. Slippery, slippery slope. Right, I hope I've been able to help answer and solve your problem this week. If not, leave it for me down there in the comments section below. I love trying to help you fix your bikes. And as ever, remember to like and share this video with your friends too. And don't forget to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And now for two more cracking videos, how about clicking just down here and just down here.